We have a lot to talk about with Edgar Allan Poe. I won't be able to cover everything because I want to keep this video as short as possible. So we'll go over a couple of things with the Casca of Amontillado. We'll do a little bit of annotating. And if you guys have any questions about anything in the text that I don't cover, email me or ask me in class. All right, so first of all, Poe is uh, weird, right? He's a weird guy. Uh, let's see here. He had kind of a weird upbringing. He lived with... Uh, an adopted family that he didn't quite get along with um, and he ended up being like cut out of their inheritance and their will so he didn't really have a whole lot um, as he moved into his adult life he worked for a newspaper and he was uh, like an editor and he also wrote stories and that's where a lot of his stories come from is they were written in the newspaper he was kind of a creep, he was reclusive, and he ended up marrying his cousin, his adopted cousin, but still kind of weird, right? But she was 13 and he was 27. So that just kind of like puts the final nail in the coffin of Poe is a creep. And I think a lot of that helps him to write the way that he writes. Now I mentioned this in class to some of you, and I don't think that Poe is a good writer just because he's creepy. I think he's a genius writer, and I think his creepiness makes him really good at writing the type of stories that he writes, which is gothic horror. Now, he doesn't write anything else except for short stories and poetry, so he's really locked into a certain genre, kind of a niche market. And you can get his complete works, the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe, in uh, one volume, and it's got all of his poetry and all of his short stories. And that is a really good book to have uh, to reference every once in a while, especially if you're into literature and you want to be able to find references uh, for other works because Poe has been cited in so many other works. He's also credited with inventing the first detective story, The Murders of the Rue Morgue, and he is also one of the authors that you will most likely see being translated or used or alluded to in lots of TV shows and movies. Even The Simpsons has a Raven episode for one of their Halloween episodes that they did a number of years ago that is based on Poe's poem, The Raven. All right, so let's talk about the Cask of Amontillado a little bit and just kind of dig into it. Like I said, I won't be able to cover everything, but I'm going to try to annotate what I think is important and talk about just a couple of things to help get the story rolling for you. This is the type of story that if you miss the very beginning or if you're lost partway through, it's really hard to catch back up. So you want to make sure that you're a careful, close reader. All right, so story overall is about Montresor, who is this rich dude. And during Carnival, which is like this big, huge carnival that they're having, um, think like Fat Tuesday or Mardi Gras, but like on a real grand scale in Europe, uh, which also has its symbolistic uh, attributes to the story, the, the fact that this is taking place right before Lent. It's time to purge all of your needs and wants and desires before you give something up for Lent. But uh, Montresor has a grudge with Fortunato, and we don't ever know what it is. He just says, the thousand injuries of Fortunato I bore as best I could, until he ventured upon insult and then I vowed revenge. And then the entire story is about him getting his revenge. But it's not super simple. If it was easy, he would just walk up to Fortunato at Carnival and stab him and be like, I have gotten my revenge, you are now going to die. And that doesn't work that way. Because Montresor is a scheming, psychotic, sociopathic murderer. He goes through very meticulous steps in order to make sure not only does he get away with this crime by not being caught, but also that Fortunato doesn't know that he's walking into his own death the entire time. Now, if you go back and reread the story, you're going to see there's a lot of clues along the way that Fortunato should have picked up on, and we as readers should have picked up on, but didn't. And that's the genius about this story, is it's unpredictable, and you're reading to the end because you want to see what happens similar to how Fortunato is following Montresor to the end because he is so curious about trying the Amontillado, the specialty wine that he feels like he is entitled to taste and judge. 
the first few paragraphs of the text before we actually get to the dialogue really sets up the scene and tells us what's going on. And we have to read carefully. Now, keep in mind that Poe was really good at creating realistic narrators. And the narrator in this story is the protagonist, Montresor. It's a first-person point of view. And that will have a few implications later on in the story when we talk about the viewpoint of the story. But you're going to see here that Montresor is an incredibly well-spoken person. Sentences just as this. It is equally unredressed when the Avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. Now, if you unpack that, you're going to see that there's a lot going on there that tells us not only about his intentions, but about the type of person that he is because of the way that he speaks. Now, he moves along here talking about the carnival season, the supreme madness. Uh, he has encountered Fortunato, who is wearing motley, who is dressed like a jester or a fool. And he had on a tight-fitting party-striped dress, and that does not mean that he is wearing a dress. That means that he is dressed a certain way, his manner of dressing. And he had the conical cap and bells, which will come into play later on in the story when he is moving his head and those bells are shaking as he is being walled up alive by Montresor. So here we have Fortunato being dressed up as a fool, which is ironic because his name is Fortunato, which he is not fortunate. He is very unfortunate and actually quite stupid. Now, he, Fortunato, is kind of brought into the game here because Montresor knows that Fortunato values or has a maybe an inflated ego of his connoisseurship of wine. And so what he does is he tells, Montresor tells Fortunato, I have this really rare wine, this Amontillado, I have a whole cask of it, like a barrel of it basically, and I want to make sure that it's real. He baits him in, he baits Fortunato in by saying, I could go ask Lucchesi. Now Lucchesi and Fortunato obviously have some sort of a rivalry here because Fortunato is upset about that and he says, no, Lucchesi is an ignoramus, I will go instead. Now, it doesn't mean that he is going to help out Montresor as if they are buddies, but he's going because he is greedy, and so Montresor is playing on his greed. And that's the first step in a number of things that happens as Fortunato is brought blindly into his death, and Montresor kind of leads him along the way and even gives him hints about what's happening. And that's kind of the cool thing about this story is we as readers don't catch these hints right away, neither does Fortunato until it's too late. And then we're left at the end realizing, oh my gosh, we have just witnessed a murder, basically. Now, in order to understand the text, one thing that can help you guys quite a bit is to write down who is speaking where. So this is I said to him. This is Montresor speaking. And then we have Fortunato, and then Montresor, Fortunato, Montresor, Fortunato, And this will help you guys to keep track of who is speaking when. And that's just going to be a, something that's going to help you to understand, especially in the beginning and towards the end, when there's fast-paced dialogue, it's going to help you to understand what's going on and keep track of who is saying what. Now, we're back to Montresor. Fortunato says, let's go to your vaults. Now, he talks about these vaults, these catacombs, and this is because... Montresor is a really rich guy. He lives in like a castle, basically. He has catacombs under his house, which is basically a graveyard where all of his ancestors would have been buried or their bodies would have been laid to rest or basically their bones would just be sitting there. You can still see catacombs, like actual catacombs, in lots of cities throughout Europe and Rome. Paris is very famous for its catacombs. You can do catacomb tours. It's kind of cool. It's really creepy, but it's pretty cool too. All right. Um, so they go through this dialogue and... Basically, what's happening here is they end up at Montresor's house, and Montresor then keeps saying that he wants to look out for Fortunato's health. He talks about the niter, he talks about Fortunato's cough, 
he keeps on saying, um, we will go back, All right? Montresor says, we will go back. Your health is precious, and that's ironic. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. So he's playing up to Fortunato's vanity, which is making Fortunato think like, oh, this is a great guy to hang out with because he keeps complimenting me. Along the way, Montresor also keeps giving Fortunato wine to ensure that he is well drunk as he's going down to these catacombs. Uh, so as we move along, you just want to keep track of who is saying what. And that's going to help you guys quite a bit. For example, this page is almost all dialogue. And so what you need to do is make sure that as you are reading, you keep track of who is saying what. Uh, a couple of other things that show up that are kind of cool. Um, so he gives him a flagon of de Grave, which is basically another type of wine. And the symbolism or the pun, in fact, behind the name de Grave sounds like grave. So it's like he's giving him his own grave. And his eyes flash with a fierce light, which shows us that he is really interested in these different types of rare wines. He laughed and threw the bottle upwards with a gesticulation I did not understand. Now this part gets a little bit confusing, but this is really him doing some sort of a weird secret hand gesture about being in the Masons, a Freemason. And then what happens here is kind of awkward uh, because Montresor then pulls out an actual trowel, a trowel that you would use to lay down the mortar to lay bricks. And Fortunato's like, what are you doing? Why do you have that? And Montresor says, well, I'm a mason. Why would I not carry this? And that's the literal tool of a mason is the trowel. And Fortunato is talking about the figurative Freemasons, the secret society. And he should catch this as weird. He should be like, why are you carrying a literal trowel with you? Montresor is basically showing Fortunato the murder weapon. And Fortunato doesn't catch on to anything because it's an obscure thing to use for a murder weapon. Now, these are things that we as readers also don't get. We just think maybe Montresor is kind of this eccentric, weird, rich guy that carries a trowel around. We don't know, right? Why are we not questioning it? That's the genius behind Poe's writing is we are starting to trust this character and we're going along with him because he is our protagonist and we're following his story and he's the one telling it, which will be important later on. So they continue on down this path. They are going into the catacombs. Montresor keeps bringing up Lucchesi. He keeps saying, you know, we can get Lucchesi. So he keeps baiting uh, Fortunato. And eventually they get down to the point where he has put Fortunato into a little niche or a corner and chained him up to the wall. And Fortunato is both stupid and drunk at this point, And so he doesn't really know what's going on. And his blind kind of need or vanity to go after the Amontillado and try it is making him not see all of these signs that are taking place. And this is when Montresor begins to build up the masonry wall, build up the stone wall that he has calculated and laid out in order to get his friend down there, his friend. Oh, and by the way, uh, some of you guys caught this in the, in the quiz and mentioned this, that he told his, Montresor told all of his servants all of the people that work at his house to go out for the evening or not to go out for the evening because he's going to be back and he knew that what that meant was they would all take off right because it's carnival so they all took off so he understands the psychology behind people he understands how to get in their heads the cool thing about this is we start to think that montresor is a real person he is a narrator created by poe and poe has many different narrators that he creates in his stories that all have kind of different motives and um He's really good at digging into that psychosis of the human spirit. All right, so he then, Montresor, then builds up this wall. And we have a succession of loud and shrill screams. And we have Montresor stopping at certain points to be satisfied with his work, the work of building the wall and hearing Fortunato scream. And we're going to dig into this part in class uh, 
on Thursday so that you guys will really see how the form of this writing follows the function. It's kind of like he's building a wall with the text. It's kind of cool. So he leaves him down there and he finally begins to think that, well, Fortunato finally thinks that, hey, this is, this is no longer a joke. And he starts to, to scream. At that point, Fortunato is really kind of living this up. He loves this. This is what he wanted. He wanted to get his revenge. Revenge for something that we don't even know. We don't even have an idea of what happened, what this insult or this injury was that he, uh, Fortunato has brought down upon Montresor. Uh, when we get to the end of this, we have this line here that says, For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them, meaning the bones down here. And it's kind of creepy to think that it's been 50 years. And it makes it even creepier when we think about who our narrator is, because he says it's at the end, for half of the century, no one has disturbed them, no mortal has disturbed them. And if we go back to the beginning, and we look at the beginning of the text, it says, the thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could. But when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. Why would we know the nature of his soul? That's an excellent question to ask about this text because we didn't even probably pick up on that at the beginning, but why would we know the nature of his soul? Is he confessing to his children, his wife, a loved one, a priest? Is he in a insane asylum? Can we even trust this narrator? This is super complex and it all makes the story more interesting. And that's what Poe does. He doesn't just give us a story that we end with. He gives us a story that continues to creep us out and live on and maybe even creep us out more and more when we think that one man was able to create so many stories of this magnitude and with these creepy narrators. And that's the genius behind Poe. A twisted genius, but genius. Now, there's so much more that we can cover here, but I want to try to keep this video very short. Uh, if there are any other questions, we will cover them in class a little bit more. But one thing that you need to think about for tomorrow when we meet up together in class is how does Poe create the feeling or mood? Why do we feel creeped out? Why do we feel that we are kind of following down this crazy deranged rabbit hole with him? Why do we keep reading? Besides the fact that I'm making you guys read for class. But what is it about this story that compels us? What is it about the story that is so creepy? Especially once we go back and reread it and figure out the calculations that have been taken to basically bury this man alive and have him disappear from society. All right, um, that's it. I will see you guys in class.